Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're attending from. Thank you for joining us today for Pacific Historic Parks History Talks, brought to you in partnership with Edutainment Learning. I'm Nicholas Puzan, the Education Interpretation Coordinator for Pacific Historic Parks. We are a nonprofit organization who works in partnership with the National Park Service. Together, we support Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Hawaii, home of the USS Arizona Memorial. Warren the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam, American Memorial Park in Saipan, Kalapapa National Historical Park in Molokai, and Diamond Head State Monument in Hawaii. Our mission is to remember, honor, and understand World War II in the Pacific. Through education and interpretive programs, we strive to perpetuate the memory of historical events and honor the people that were involved. History Talks is an interactive series designed to share the history and stories of Pearl Harbor and World War II in the Pacific. History Talk series was designed for students, educators, the general audience, and organizations from across the world to provide live interaction during these uncertain times. Today, we are honored to have as our guest speaker, Marianas historian Don Farrell. Don is best known locally as an educator and a political activist who has published several books during his 40 years in the Mariana Islands including his latest publication, Tinian and the Bomb. Today, he will be presenting about Operation Forager, the battles for Saipan and Tinian. Take it away, Don. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate what you guys are doing and having the opportunity to present this information to, uh, to people around the world who are interested in the history of the Mariana Islands. Um, it's been uh, quite a, a venture for me since I arrived in the Marianas back in 1977 and had the opportunity to meet so many people in those early years who still vividly remembered the, the war years and, and were willing to sit down and, and tell me their stories uh, of the war. And then since then, having the opportunity to work with Stephen Ambrose, historical tours, military historical tours, valor tours, so many uh, uh, people have come through the islands wanting to see firsthand the battle, the battle scenes and the battlefield. And, um, and working with them, uh, many of them were World War II veterans or the sons and daughters of, of World War II veterans. And they, um, uh, they always had uh, interesting and warm stories to tell and quite often something uh, that would lead me down a new trail. So. It's been a great pleasure for me, and I'm very pleased to be able to make this presentation to you all this morning. And again, I, I, I very much enjoy receiving questions from the audience. If it's something that's important to you, it becomes something that's important to me. So please, if you have questions, send them to, uh, to the Pacific History Park Center, and they'll send the questions on to me. Uh, or, uh, or if you can get my email address, which I, I don't mind giving out, I... Uh, I would certainly be glad to, to respond to you directly. Uh, I, we, we should make a, a, a statement here that the photographs that you're going to see, uh, the collecting of those photographs in Washington, DC, and, and uh, the archives across the United States uh, was funded in part by the National Endowment for the, uh, the Arts, which supports the CNMI uh, Council for the Humanities and of course to Pacific History Parks uh, for helping put this all together. This is the story of the Northern Attack Force, right? Operation Forager itself was much, also included the Battle for Guam, but we simply don't have the time to include that in here. None of it would have happened had it not been for the vision of Admiral Ernest J. King, Commander in Chief of the entire United States Navy, both Atlantic and Pacific. He was the one that foresaw that the Marianas, uh, being in the middle of the Central Pacific area, was the key to the, uh, to the campaign for the Pacific. He was later supported by General Henry H. Uh, Hap Arnold, uh, the commander in chief of the United States Army Air Forces, who recognized that the Mariana Islands were the closest location to Japan where B 29s could be based for their plan for the ultimate defeat of, of Japan. So these two gentlemen uh, deserve the credit for having initiated uh, the concept of Operation Forager. Operation Forager itself was a, a massive operation uh, 
that began in Pearl Harbor and stretched all the way across the Pacific Ocean to the Philippines. Can we have the next slide, please? There's a, a map here, right, uh, which I borrowed from a, uh, a well-known text, uh, and it demonstrates to you the size of the war in the Pacific. If you look down at the bottom of the map, you'll see Southern Pacific forces. That would be General MacArthur and the naval forces that were assigned to him by Admiral King and Admiral Nimitz as they fought their way back towards the Philippines. It had been his vision that not only would he return to the Philippines and recapture the Philippines, but using bases from there, moved north to Formosa. Now, Formosa is known today as, as Taiwan. And it was his plan that all of the forces in the Central Pacific would gather at Formosa and together under General uh, MacArthur's command, they would then advance northeast to Japan. Admiral King recognized, however, that it would be better to have a two, uh, a, a double front, a second front in the Pacific Ocean to confuse the enemy, but also that he was quite sure that this would expedite uh, achieving the end of the war uh, rather than having a single front coming from the South. By crossing the Pacific and establishing bases in the Marianas, those B-29s would, would be able to uh, directly attack Japan, but also the Navy would have the opportunity then to strike from the Marianas in any direction that it wanted to. So in the fall of, of 1943, if you look at the arrow that goes from Pearl Harbor southwest towards the Gilbert Islands, Admiral Spruance insisted on the capture of the Gilbert Islands first so that he could put the 7th Air Force down there, and their B-24 bombers and long-range fighters would then be able to cover their southern flank as they moved into the Marshall Islands, which began with Majuro and then Kwajalein and Inuitok. That Those captures were taken then uh, shortly after the first of the year. At that time, uh, Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Spruance were able to move their forces forward to the, the giant lagoon at Majuro, and as well as putting forces in Kwajalein and Anahuitoc. And again, with the Navy forces moved forward the Army Air Force's 7th Air Force. And they were able then to begin bombardment of forward areas, including Japanese bases at Pompeii, uh, truck, which is now known as Chuk, Woliai in the Caroline Islands, Yap, Ulithi, you know, the other islands to the south of the Marianas, again, to protect the southern flank as they made the big jump to the Marianas. We say the big jump to the Marianas, and this is absolutely an amazing feat. Uh, when we look back on it today, by the time they were ready to go to leave the Marshall Islands for the Marianas, two years had gone by. And in those two years, the United States industrial base was able to build a completely new Navy. Whereas we had only four aircraft carriers at Hawaii at the beginning of the war, now we had 15. And the entire fleet had, had grown from the shipyards from all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast to the United States. On this mission from the Marshall Islands to the Mariana Islands, there were 535 combat ships, along with another 300 supporting ships. Now, those, that fleet was led by Admiral Raymond Spruance, commander of the 5th Fleet. And he had been involved in the war, of course, since before it even be began in the planning stages, and now would lead this fleet which included another 300 support ships. So we had 800 ships carrying about 125,000 combat troops to capture three islands, along with all of the support facilities and support groups necessary. Admiral Spruance, of course, was aware that by this time, uh, Admiral Nagumo, who had commanded the Japanese fleet at the Battle of Pearl Harbor and sunk the American fleet there, 
had been demoted after the Battle of Midway, which he lost miserably, and uh, was now sta uh, a ground officer stationed in Saipan. So Nimitz knew, he, or Spruitz knew that he was headed towards his old nemesis, Admiral Nagumo, and I think that he did it with more than a little relish. Coming out of Majuro Lagoon was this fleet. Now you're looking at the aircraft carrier fleet, 15 of them, along with all the supporting cruisers, battleships, destroyers, and a whole slew of other aircraft that were to protect the fleet and provide advanced operations when they got to the Marianas. This uh, famous picture, you saw a copy of it hanging on the wall behind Admiral King in the first slide, is called Murderer's Row. And that's exactly what they intended to do when they got to the Marianas. Admiral Spruance commanded the most powerful naval armada ever assembled in the United States uh, in the Pacific. Aboard the fleet were two uh, combat leaders, Admiral Raymond Turner, commander of uh, the landing forces. Now his job was to oversee shipping all of the command forces and their support facilities and combat ships to the Marianas. Riding on board with him was Major uh, Lieutenant General uh, Holland Smith, the United States Marine Corps. He would command all of the ground troops once he landed in Saipan and had established his headquarters on shore. That meant that he would command not only Marine forces, but also United States Army forces, which uh, led to quite a conflict. For those of you who have studied the, the Pacific history, the story of Ralph versus, uh, or Smith versus Smith, Ralph Smith versus Holland Smith, uh, is an, an argument that will go on. Holland Smith fired Army General Ralph Smith in the middle of combat, something that is unheard of in combat. So uh, the aircraft carriers went ahead and, and uh, these 15 aircraft carriers were all designated different targets all the way from Iwo Jima south to truck. And their job was to establish air superiority over the Mariana Islands to ensure that the battle fleet, once it got there, would not come under air attack from any of the Mariana Islands or the associated reinforced islands that were still under Japanese, excuse me, Japanese control. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you see the uh, F-6F uh, fighter plane shooting some, some rockets. Uh, this aircraft was far superior to the Japanese. Now the map at right is also very important. It shows not only the landing beaches in the south, but also that there was a fake landing staged in the north. The objective of that, of course, was to draw troops away from the south to help uh, support the troops that would be landing in the south. And if you look carefully at the map, you'll see Chalan Kanoa, often misspelled as Chalan Kanoa, as the Japanese pronounced it. Those were the landing beaches. North of Chalan Kanoa was the 2nd Marine Division. South of uh, Chalan Kanoa was the 4th Marine Division. 4th Marine Division's job was to cut directly across the island to Magician Bay and isolate uh, Aslito Airfield in the south, while the 2nd Marine Division would move north and northeast towards the high ground, Mount Tapachal. Here you see the battle fleet has arrived. Uh, uh, Admiral Mitscher has already established um, uh, air superiority. There are no Japanese aircraft in the air on this day. You see our, our tiny little amphibious tractors. Uh, they're, they're, they're driving through the battle fleet. Their, their support air uh, fleet is, is far, anchored farther out of shore, away from, from any Japanese gunfire. And there were 900 of these amphibious tractors heading uh, towards the beach that day. The ship is firing is actually the U.S. Indianapolis, Admiral Spruance's flagship. And here they are at the beach. Uh, 
Uh, you, you can see the looks on, I mean, everybody's faces, and I don't believe this was very different from any other amphibious operation that had been conducted heretofore. And it goes to show that no matter how much planning went into an invasion, once you get to the beach, it's chaos. Some 2,000 Marines died that day on Saipan. Unfortunately for the United States, uh, our uh, military intelligence, quote unquote, had underestimated the strength of the Japanese uh, defending forces on Saipan by 50%. Uh, Admiral Spruance had been expecting 15,000 Japanese troops on Saipan, when in fact there were 30,000. Here you see the, sub, the, the uh, Chalankanoa area where the, the central landings took place. At your left is Sugar Dock. It's called Sugar Dock because if you look right straight inland from the dock, you'll see a smokestack. Well, that's among the remains of what was one of the largest sugar mills in the world. That is the sugar mill at, at Saipan. Uh, and the dock itself was used to to load 100 um, uh, pound bags of refined sugar into lighters that took them out to cargo ships that carried them to Japan and Korea where they were sold primarily to, to military services. The much larger pontoon dock at the right uh, was established by United States Seabees and helped of course very, very much with the landing of troops and hit, uh, particularly heavy equipment. And you can see directly across the island, you cannot see Isley Field, which is off to the right, uh, known by the Japanese as Asalito Airfield. To the left, uh, you, again, you cannot see it in this picture, is Mount Tapachal. So the job of the 4th Marine Division was to drive directly across this peninsula to the far side of the island, cut the island in half. And in the upper right-hand corner, you see the remains of the giant sugar mill. Well, battles cause casualties, uh, whereas the Japanese uh, had very, very little support for their casualties. Uh, they were all, of course, expected to die in battle. The United States had a completely different opinion. Uh, these Americans could be saved and live to either fight another day or go home and help uh, build a new America. So the, wound, the wounded Americans were removed from the beach and taken uh, by Higgins' boat to ships offshore where they were evacuated to military hospitals, many of them uh, in, in the Marshall Islands, most of them back in, uh, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, now, at, on, on, uh, by June 17th, Admiral Spruance had received the message that the Japanese uh, Imperial Navy mobile fleet was coming out to fight. This was not unexpected. As a matter of fact, when Admiral King made his pitch to both the joint American Joint Chiefs of Staff and the combined British American Chiefs of Staff, uh, he felt that one of the side benefits of an attack on the Marianas would be that the Japanese Imperial Navy would have to finally come out for what everybody was considering to be the key uh, naval battle of the Pacific. Admiral, uh, Admiral Mark Mitscher up left commanded all of the 15 aircraft carriers and he then went with Spruance uh, out to meet Admiral uh, Oza uh, Ozawa uh, up at the right hand corner in what became known as the Marianas Turkey Shoot, formerly known as the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And here we see some of the action. Um, th this is the Japanese fleet under air, air bombardment, and I believe that is the Shokako. No, it is, I forgot one of the uh, carriers being heavily damaged. They actually lost three carriers altogether. Added to the four carriers they lost at Midway, the United States had now established clear 
naval air superiority over the Japanese, meaning that the United States fleet could travel wherever it wanted in the Pacific. In the upper right-hand corner, you see a Japanese Zero going down one of the 350 planes destroyed by Mark Michener's flyboys that day. And in the bottom right-hand corner is a very famous photograph of one of, uh, one of Michener's pilots who shot down six aircraft in one day, becoming a quote, quote, unquote, ace in one day. Uh, we would like to also mention that the Navajo Code Talkers did serve on both Saipan and Tinian. I was very fortunate to get to meet these two gentlemen when they returned to Guam 40 some years later, uh, to, Saip uh, to Tinian, I'm sorry, about 40 years later. And, and uh, we had a wonderful time with them. We brought the elementary school students down to the beach and, and they got to talk to them. It should be noted that there was no real code that they were using. They were simply speaking their native language, the Navajo language, which of course the Japanese didn't know. So there were uh, Navajo speakers on board ships that could interpret exactly what the Navajos were saying in the field. And that gave us uh, a communication system that the Japanese could not interpret. They were extremely valuable to our ground success. And then the battle went on, right? It lasted all the way until uh, July 9th. Uh, the fight was, was a miserable battle. Uh, the island of, of Saipan is, is long and relatively narrow and mountainous. And of course, they're all coral islands. So they are pockmarked with caves like the one you see the flamethrower uh, working on there. Uh, the flamethrowers actually didn't burn the people to death they sucked all the oxygen out of the cave and the people died from asphyxiation. And then quite often a bulldozer, a CB would come by and actually seal the cave up. Uh, some have been recovered since then. Up in the upper right hand corner, you can see uh, a Marine walking away from a buddy who died in action. And to mark his location for the graves registration team that would be coming by later, he made sure that the the rifle had fixed bayonet and he stuck it in the ground upside down to mark that location. Most people don't know that many of these Marines uh, uh, who died there were not buried on Saipan, same thing on Tinian. Uh, many of them were taken back to ships. They died aboard ship. The ship would go to sea and they had sea burials. At the end of the war, all of the Marines and soldiers who died on Saipan and Tinian were exhumed and their bodies were returned to the United States for reburial, usually uh, with their uh, families in their hometown. Here's some of the rugged terrain. Uh, they're, they're reaching the plat at the, the left hand photograph here shows Magician Bay up to the left. And uh, these are men from the second Marine division who are making their way to the top of Mount Tapachal, fighting uphill all of the way. And of course that required uh, artillery support uh, as well as, as heavy weapons. Our tank support was superlative uh, and uh, supported our troops throughout the battle for Saipan and Tinian. The last bonsai uh, on July 7th was a horrific event to say the least. Uh, General Saito, the commanding officer on Saipan, recognized that, well, he knew as soon as he saw Admiral Spruance's fleet return on June 20th, uh, that uh, his fleet had been, uh, had been defeated and that there would be no Japanese Imperial Navy coming over the horizon like the cavalry to save them. And so on June, July 7th, he uh, issued the order for the final uh, bonsai charge. There were somewhere between three and 4,000 men in that charge. Not all of them died, but a vast majority of them did. Uh, and you can see them strewn on the beach here, a, a very careful, 
search would, uh, if they hadn't already been removed, would find Marines among them. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, what was a, a tank ditch filled with dead Japanese. And if you look carefully, you can see sticks uh, sharpened uh, to use as spears because they had run out of weapons by now and they were fulfilling their obligation to their Bushido code to die with honor in battle rather than surrender. There were thousands and thousands of civilians on, on Saipan at the beginning of the war. During the Japanese administration, the sugar industry that was developed by the Japanese had been hugely successful. They employed uh, directly or indirectly virtually every Chamorro and Carolinian on Saipan who wanted to work. Um, but they also imported thousands and thousands of uh, Japanese from uh, the home islands as well as from Okinawa as well as uh, Koreans. Many of the Koreans uh, were technicians working on either the factory or the railroad construction that, that fed the sugarcane from the fields to the factories. They had led a very peaceful and prosperous life up until late 1943, when reinforcements began to arrive from Japan. It should be noted that these were not slave laborers. The Chamorros and the Carolines were not slave laborers. Uh, they had become Japanized. Japan had occupied the Marianas in 1914 at the beginning of World War I. This is two generations later. They lost everything they had in the war, including so many of their relatives, particularly the very young and the very old. At the right, you will see them where they have been interned. They were uh, captured and held in protective custody uh, for the duration of the war. And at the bottom of the right, you see a group of Catholic sisters who had been uh, on island before the battle began and survived in the jungle with the civilians and are seen here now at Camp Sasupi on Saipan. The battle uh, was over. The island was declared secured on July 9th. The next day, uh, the admirals and generals all assembled uh, at this little concrete house with a tin roof in Chalancanoa. Um, uh, this is one of the many homes that were built by and for the employees of the Japanese sugarcane factory. Um, of the 71,000 Americans who had landed with both the, the second and fourth Marine divisions, as well as the uh, 27th Infantry Division, a total of 2,900, nearly 3,000 were killed and 10 and a half thousand were wounded. Some 30,000 Japanese died. At right, you'll see General Holland Smith right after this uh, Flag raising ceremony uh, was held. Holland Smith uh, proudly gave uh, Admiral King, who you'll see sitting in the front right of the Jeep, and Admiral Nimitz uh, sitting in the back. Uh, I always get a kick out of this picture of uh, General Smith standing up. I mean, there are still hundreds of Japanese hiding in those jungles back behind him, standing up with a carbine that I doubt he carried during the battle, uh, but it has become a, an iconoclastic uh, photograph of American leadership at the end of the Battle of Saipan. So with the Battle of Saipan finished, Admiral Spruance and Admiral Nimitz had agreed that the right thing to do was to give the Marines uh, uh, two weeks of rest and recuperation and also to receive replacements for all of the dead. The, both divisions, the second and the, the fourth, had, had taken heavy casualties at Saipan. So there were a lot of raw recruits that ended up being involved in this battle. It took them a little time to decide 
where the invasion would take place. Originally planned was the invasion would take place in the south along the long, beautiful, sandy beaches of, uh, in front of Tinian Town. Uh, that had been decided by Admiral Turner early in, in the planning. And uh, then as during those two weeks, the Marines went to, to uh, Admiral Turner and they said, you know, do we always have to land right in the teeth of the enemy? Can we maybe outsmart them this time? And so they decided to conduct a fake landing at Tinian Town, where the Japanese certainly would be expecting the hills right around, uh, surrounding the back of Tinian Town uh, were, were covered with, with all kinds of Japanese heavy weapons, including six inch uh, naval shore guns and, and a variety of other weapons. Um, and they decided in the end that they would land at two tiny little beaches at the northern end of Tinian called White One and White Two known as Unai Chulu and Unai Babwi by the locals. They considered landing at Yellow Beach over on the eastern side of the island, but that beach was fairly well de uh, uh, defended. It had, uh, had been uh, a lot of uh, mines placed there, a lot of barbed wire stretched on the beach, and that's an onshore wind, and the amphibious tractors are not seaworthy vessels. Too many vessels could have been lost just trying to cross the reef. So the landing would take place at, uh, at these tiny little beaches, White One and White Two. And in actuality, uh, the vast majority of the men loaded directly into their landing vehicles in Saipan. You see that A, B, C, D? That actually is marking the, uh, the artillery barrage, 200 long toms and artillery pieces of equipment firing against northern, uh, northern Tinian. But the, the Marines themselves landed directly into their uh, landing craft at Saipan and then scooted across the, uh, the, the three-mile channel for a shore-to-shore -shore invasion, one of the few shore-to-shore -shore invasions of the Pacific War. All right, here down at the bottom, you, you're going to see a lot of, there's a lot of things to see in this picture, which we don't have time to go over everything. But if you look along the shoreline at the very bottom of your, the left-hand photograph there, you'll see a little tiny beach. That's going to be the landing beach. That's one of the two of these tiny little landing beaches. In, in, in the island, you can see the patchwork quilt. Those are all farmsteads. That's all sugar cane. Uh, growing there. And then within that sugarcane field had been built this giant Japanese aerodrome that the Japanese called Hagoi, because there's a, a little lake there, and Chim the, the term Hagoi in Chamorro does mean lake, and next to it there had been a Japanese village. So there they built their big aerodrome there. This was a massive naval air station. It was home to the 1st Naval Air Division. Uh, it was a major Japanese uh, uh, air base. All brand new aircraft leaving Japan and heading south to truck, Pompe, the Marshall, wherever, passed through this airfield on its way. In the right-hand picture, it's uh, a little bit larger. You can see the same airfield, but you can also see another runway under construction. Now, that is going to become Northfield Tinian, home for the 313th bomb wing. The first runway will be built right on top of the old Japanese runway in the aerodrome. The other little runway will become strip number three for the, for the uh, American airfields. This was the first time that napalm was used as an organic weapon in combat. Uh, now, napalm had been experimented with in, in, the, uh, in the European theater. Uh, people had dropped it to see what it could do, but it had never been actually incorporated in a battle plan. Uh, General Schmidt, on, uh, who was going to be in charge of the actual invasion of Tinian, ordered it ahead of time and had it uh, put into 
um, uh, jettisonable wing tanks on, on, on uh, our, air, our fighter aircraft to drop on the invasion uh, beaches. So this is White Beach receiving its first load of napalm in combat. Here you see the uh, troops coming ashore, uh, the, uh, up on the upper left-hand corner. Those, those are the very first Marines from the uh, 4th Marine Division coming ashore, waiting ashore, uh, looking for mines to make sure that the vehicles that were coming after them didn't drive over a mine. And then below, you can see where the beach has been expanded by the Seabees. Uh, and you can see a tank coming ashore from an LCT. And then in the background, the far background on the left, you can see the Hagoi Aerodrome uh, burning and, uh, where it's already been attacked by Mitchell's aircraft. And then a road constructed by the Seabees headed towards that field. And in the right hand picture, you can see that that's the very first wave, guys that are waiting ashore up uh, in the upper left-hand corner came to shore uh, during this wave and there they are at that landing at that little tiny beach before it had been opened up. Now here's the beach the day after the invasion. Uh, the Seabees had done a miraculous job on Saipan. During those two weeks they had come to recognize because of the, the UDT group that uh, came ashore at Tinian before invasion, that there was this coral, small coral cliff line there, and that there's no way that tanks or heavy equipment would be able to get up there. So the men that you see in the upper right-hand corner are Seabees from the 18th and 121st Naval Construction Battalions who created what was called a doodle bug. They used uh, steel beams, I-beams, from uh, the sugarcane factory and railroad ties from the sugarcane factory to create this sort of portable ramp that they loaded on top of, of an amphibious tractor. And the amphibious tractor would pull up to the butt up against this uh, coral head and, and uh, CBs would jump out and tie down the front end of it. And then the amphibious tractor simply backed out from under it dropping the tail end into the water and it became a ramp. And so that's how they were able to get their tanks and heavy equipment ashore. In the back, you'll see where the pontoon uh, uh, has already been put in place, pontoon bridge by the 302nd Special uh, NCB unit. Here's a better shot of the, uh, of the beachhead and the pontoon. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the morning after the first, uh, after the invasion, you can see the fleet, the huge fleet uh, in the background. On all of those ships out there are the supplies, the other trucks and tanks and equipment and men uh, that would be landing on Tinian. And there you can see the Seabees from the 302nd uh, installing the pontoon bridge there. Uh, by, Jun by July 26, that's, the landing was on July 24th, this is, I guess, two days afterwards, had been widened, heavy equipment was landing. Uh, I love this picture because, uh, a photograph, because it's got a shot of one of those little spotter airplanes up there. And uh, anybody with a pea shooter practically can shoot that thing down. So it's amazing the nerve that these guys had to fly at close range and spot individual groups of Japanese and be able to call in those, those spots to the fire support teams offshore. Here's a picture of that northern end of the island uh, that was, uh, this comes from uh, the uh, uh, Marine Corps monograph. Uh, it shows the airfield and strip number three, or what they called airfield number three you can see white one and white two, the two landing beaches, uh, the 24th Regiment, 4th Marine Division, and the 25th Regiment, 4th Marine Division, landed side by side, and eventually the 23rd came ashore on their right, forming 
the initial boundary for, uh, for defensive stand that night. And then you'll see coming from the south, these red arrows, that's the Japanese counterattack. It was a, it was a major uh, tank battle that took place there. And several stories have been written about that tank battle and the Marines that took it out with uh, bazookas. Uh, it was a pretty amazing. And of course, there was also ground attacks from the north and from the central area. Most important in the photograph is the high ground behind it. That's Mount Lasu, which isn't really a mountain. It's only 540 feet high, but it is the highest point on Tinian. That whole plateau south of, uh, or north rather, of that 200-foot uh, line is, uh, uh, is absolutely flat. And that's why it was so important for the construction. There would be four runways there supporting the 20,000 men of the 313th Bomb Wing. And of course, just as on Saipan, once the, uh, the Marines had cut across the island, now the second and fourth Marine divisions were uh, lined up. They had captured the high ground, Mount Lasu, and their job was to march south again, past cray caves and crevices and through this uh, shiver cane that you'll see on the left. <coughs> and once again, the job now became bringing out the, uh, the civilians and, and taking them into protective uh, custody. Uh, not all of them would die, I mean, would be saved again, uh, Lots of babies died. You can see this, this family in, at the bottom there. Uh, after they had been under air and naval bombardment since June 11th, when Mr. had arrived with his aircraft carrier fleet. It's now July tw uh, 31st. So for six weeks, these poor people who had been living a prosperous life on the island of Tinian are suddenly destitute, dying. Their clothes are rags. The children are sick. You can see that they're all barefoot. Uh, disease is pandemic. Uh, it, it was simply a horrible sight. And to see the photographs of these battle-hardened Marines having seen so many of their comrades die on both Saipan and Tinian, now taking care of these civilians, uh, it's a heart-rendering Photograph. This is what Tinian Town looked like when the battle was over. Uh, this Tinian Town held a population of about 6,000 people. The total population of Tinian before uh, the battle was about 14,000, uh, about 11,500 of them were, uh, were saved and ended up in Camp Chulu, uh, where, they, where they remained for the duration of the war. Uh, but the city that they built, the town that they built, uh, that they referred to as Tinian Town, um, uh, had been totally destroyed. The Seabees cleared the roads, uh, they also cleared mines and thousands of, of dead bodies so that the, uh, the roads could be usable again to move troops forward and equipment forward. And the flag raising was held then on August 1st. The island was declared secured. Once again, the admirals and generals came ashore. Uh, Holland Smith was not there uh, that day. So we don't have a picture of him in a Jeep with his gun. <laughs> yes, and thank you very much. I, I guess we got through that on time. I'd be very pleased to take questions from anybody. Yeah, and uh, we have a few questions, but anybody who has any more questions, feel free to message them in the chat and uh, we will let you ask Don those questions. First of all, thank you for the awesome presentation. Um, 
uh, somebody was asking this and I was wondering this myself because my grandfather actually um, was a Marine on Saipan in World War II. Hmm. And um, I just found this out because uh, it was on his, his grave sites, his placard where he had served. And so um, I, I wanted to know as well as uh, the questions that came, came through so far, what was life like for those um, in, that were coming on Saipan as, as Marines, like the first wave of Marines during World War II? All right. I'm, can you clarify that question just a little bit shorter? What, like, what was life like for them as they were as they were coming on Saipan? Um, those Marines, those first wave of Marines coming uh, during World War II. In Saipan? Yeah, like when, when oh. during World War II. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to describe what life was like. It was hell. I mean, uh, they came under they came under heavy fire long before they got to the beach. And when they got to the beach, right behind the beach was a tank ditch filled with Japanese with machine guns. The, the, most of the, the trees along the beach, that beautiful beachhead now, uh, were blown apart by the naval bombardment. So there was no place to hide. And, and uh, the Japanese held a high ground behind them with everything zeroed in. Uh, I don't know if anybody slept that night at those that survived the battle uh, and on the beach it was a matter of save your life and try to save the guy next to you so that he could help you survive the rest of the battle the, the weather was beautiful it was hot and what they ran out of water they didn't they had, they had very few rations they only had on their back and they didn't wear any armor the only armor they had was a fatigue jacket so uh, that was i don't know the brave the bravery that was shown there is beyond description for me. I, I can't imagine that. And uh, this brings me to someone else's question. They wanted to know, because not everyone on here has ever been to Saipan or Tinian, and they want to know, are the remnants of World War II, can they still be seen on these islands? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, our islands are famous uh, throughout the Pacific for our historic preservation. Uh, and, and it was one of one of my pet peeves, kind of when I when I was on the Historic Preservation Review Board. And it, uh, uh, if you travel around the island, when you arrive there, you can get a booklet that will take you from battle scene to battle scene. And uh, uh, there's 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 much uh, left to see there. And many of the buildings, uh, particularly at, at Aslito Airfield, which is now referred to as uh, Saipan International Airport. The buildings that were there and used by the Japanese were used by the, by the American Air Force, by the 73rd Bombardment Wing when they got to Saipan. And those buildings are still being used today uh, by, by uh, various government agencies, including the Red Cross has one of them. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to see on both Saipan and Tinian. For those of you who have the, the jingle in your pockets to make a trip and the time, it's a long time to get here. It's, it practically requires a, a, a two-week vacation by the time you get here and enjoy both islands to head home and be able to enjoy it all. But, but no, there's, there's a lot of battle to still be seen here. Great. We have an awesome question from Mark. Um, Mark, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, you had a great question. Feel free to ask uh, Don that. Hey, Don. I uh, really enjoyed the uh, presentation. You mentioned the 27th uh, Infantry Division of the Army. Uh, so what did they do on Saipan? Okay, uh, when, Spruance, when Spruance got the message that Ozawa was coming out to fight, he knew that he had to leave the battle scene and go out and meet Ozawa. The 27th Army Infantry Division had been the floating reserve just in case it was needed. Well, obviously, with us outnumbered two to one and with Spruance having to leave, he immediately landed the 27th Army Infantry Division. That had two repercussions. One, it certainly helped the uh, American effort on Saipan in that the 27th did move forward. And in fact, they're the ones that are given credit for the capture of Oslito Airfield. Uh, and then they were put into the battle, uh, battle line uh, as they approached uh, Mount uh, Topachow from the south. And that's where they ran into a little problem with Holland Smith. 
the 27th was not trained for uh, jungle warfare. Unlike the Marines, uh, many of the Marines had already had experience in, in various battles in the atolls of the Gilbert and Marshall Islands or Guadalcanal. And, and, uh, and so they, they were unaccustomed to it and they, they ran into trouble there. Uh, but they pulled out of it and helped finish the battle for Saipan. The other repercussion of landing the 27th was tragic for the people of Guam because that meant that Spruance had to delay the Battle of Guam for five weeks. The uh, amphibious, um, the pre-invasion bombardment of Guam had already begun, so now the Japanese knew exactly where the Marines were going to land and reinforce those, uh, those beachheads. Uh, not only did that cause problems and a lot of casualties for the Marines, but it also uh, then led to some absolutely horrific atrocities committed by the Japanese on Guam. So the 27th Army Infantry Division on, on Saipan did, uh, did their best, and the 77th Army Infantry Division landed on Guam and did a fine job there. Um, some of them became very close friends with the Marines. Good question, Mark. We have a question from Jaden, friend in the north. Um, Jaden, you should be able to unmute yourself. You had an awesome question. Feel free to ask Don. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to tell you first that your presentation is so interesting, and thanks a lot for being able to talk to us about that. Um, I was wondering, what made you discover your job as a histori historian, and what made you focus oh. on Saipan? Well, that, that's a lifetime story, sweetheart. <laughs> uh, actually, I had no interest in, in history before I came to the Marianas. My degree is in marine biology with a minor in mathematics and a degree in education, right? I came to, 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 to Guam in 77 as a school teacher. Uh, but I was interested in the war because my dad had, had landed at, uh, drove a landing craft at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And it just happened to be that the school I was teaching at uh, in Rohan Junior High had uh, virtually every uh, novel ever written about the Pacific War. And I started reading them. And then I said, well, that stuff was happening right here. And, uh, and I started asking my students' parents. And they were a little hesitant to talk to a, a statesider, an outsider. Uh, and then I got involved in the political arena. And I came, became a little bit closer, backyard barbecues. Um, and all of that, and some of the elders started telling me their stories about uh, uh, life on Guam, and that's that's what got me started. So the very the first three books I wrote were uh, were about uh, Guam, and then I met my wife on Guam, who is a Tinian Chamorro, and in '87 we moved to Tinian, and that's when I started studying history of the Northern Marianas, and uh, got interested, of course, in the battles of Saipan and Tinian. Thank you for that question, by the way. That is a great question. We had another question from Greg. He wanted to know um, what your opinion, if anything, about the um, implication of Amelia Earhart being a prisoner on Saipan, mm -hmm. if you have any opinions on the matter. Well, yes, I do have an opinion. It never happened. Here we go. You heard it here first. <laughs> I, no, I've, I've already gotten in trouble for it here. There are several elders on Saipan who swear, uh, and I have no reason to doubt that they saw a white woman and a white man uh, that they interpreted to be Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan uh, in the jail uh, in Garapan, Saipan. I have no doubt that they did. Uh, however, in 1937, Saipan, there were many other white people uh, in the Japanese Northern Mariana Islands doing a variety of businesses. So it could have just as easily been a German or a Russian. Uh, um, uh, but there is absolutely no solid evidence anywhere, right, that Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan survived the crash of their aircraft. If, if there was a shred of evidence, I would have run down the trail. And believe me, I've received so many messages. I've read all of the books on the story of Amelia Earhart, and I cannot find a trace that I believe in. 
Now, the aircraft that she flew uh, was a very popular aircraft among long distance flyers at that time. There very well uh, might have been one of those on Saipan. My good friend Gordon Marciano has been told by several Marines from the 4th Division that they physically saw her aircraft, although there was no way to know that it was her aircraft when they landed here. What they saw was the same variety of airplane that she flew. So personally, I do not believe it. That is, uh, yeah, that's 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 uh, great. Thank you for all the details. We appreciate it. We have uh, Luke. It has a great question. And um, go ahead, Luke. You should be able to talk. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to just thank you because uh, preserving history is just so important. Uh, but I'd just like to... I'd just like to know uh, what the influence that the fleet leaving leaving the battle to to engage the Japanese fleet, uh, how how that affected the timeline of the battle. Uh, actually, it had very little to do with the type uh, the timeline of the battle. However, there were many Marines uh, in the hills uh, on their way up Mount Tapachau who woke up that morning. Uh, I guess I think that would be on the 18th and the fleet was gone and it reminded them of the fleet leaving Guadalcanal and stranding them uh, without all of the food and, and water and ammunition and things they needed to continue fighting uh, the battle down there. Uh, but uh, Spruance had done his due diligence ahead of time and forced every able-bodied man available and every landing craft available to dump material and men on the beachheads north and south of, of uh, Chalan Kanoa to, uh, to keep the battle going. And he returned on the 20th. So he was gone not even a total of three days. But uh, uh, it, 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 the aircraft carriers, some of them remained in the area to maintain uh, air superiority, although there weren't any more airplanes left to shoot down. And, uh, and they also continued to help support the ground forces as they moved forward. So it did not have a significant effect on the actual progress of the battle. It just worried a few Marines. That's great. And um, so we just, because we're at the top of the hour, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for such an awesome presentation, um, both professionally and on a personal level, because it was really cool to be able to see uh, where my grandfather served. Um, so I'm with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Weston. And Weston, you, you have the floor, sir. Hey, yeah, Don, great talk. Thank you. Um, so my name is Wesson, uh, and on behalf of Pacific Historic Parks and Edutainment Learning, we would like to thank you for joining us today. And we just wanted to mention that this project was made possible by support from the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. It's a nonprofit private corporation with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Federal CARES Act. And any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this grant opportunity do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, Don, it's been an honor to have you share your experience with us and uh, we appreciate your willingness to share. And thank you again for your service. Uh, if you take a look in the chat box, we have a link that will connect you to a short survey. Uh, this will allow you the opportunity to share your feedback, suggestions, and any questions that you may have for Don that we just didn't have the opportunity to get to, but we'll hopefully we can get back to you on those. And your kind donation is an opportunity to, for us to continue to provide free interactive programs to our viewers. And mahalo, everyone. Thank you for joining today. And thank you again, Don. Wonderful talk. Mahalo.